Brothers and sisters, aloha. aloha. Good to be with you. It's good to have you here for this. We'll make this work as expeditiously as we can. We'll move through it quickly. This is uh, an encore presentation of a presentation I just gave a couple of weekends ago at BYU Provo entitled Ominous Onomastics, Symbolic Naming and Paranomasia in Old Testament Prophecy. Um, if you want to see the full written version of this, there's a book that you can purchase for about $23 or $24. Um, it's one of uh, several essays that's in, in this right here. So that's what I'm going to be talking about. Um, names, understanding the meaning of names is important in many cases to understanding different texts in the Old Testament, and this is particularly true when, when it comes to some of the prophecies of the Old Testament. Some of the prophecies revolve around um, sometimes symbolic names that are given, other times they are, there is an attempt within the prophecy to uh, lend new meaning to the name through different kinds of wordplay. Um, I want to start with Isaiah because this is a, a fairly logical entry point for us as Latter-day Saints into the Old Testament. Isaiah was commanded to give at least two sons that he had symbolic names. The first of these sons, we're introduced to his name, we're introduced to the name of the son in Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah is told to go with his son Shear Yashub to meet uh, King Ahaz. I'll, it's important to understand the, the political background of what's going on uh, at this time. And it's interesting because these are chapters that we have in the Book of Mormon that are in, in which Nephi quotes them um, almost verba verbatim from what we find, and they match up pretty well to what, what's in the King James Version of the Bible. Um, during this time, the Assyrian Empire is increasingly making incursions into the northern kingdom. The, the king of the, the northern kingdom at this time uh, has, the kingdom of Israel has allied itself with uh, Syria. You have the king of Israel and the king of Syria that have made an alliance and they want to displace Ahaz, the Davidic king, and to put a puppet king on the throne of the king of Judah. King Ahaz, who is the king, uh, the Davidic, he's a descendant of King David, and he's the king of Judah, he wants to go to the Assyrians for help. But there's a problem when you go to major world powers for help. When you make a treaty with them, there, you're often also making an agreement that you are going to toe the line with them in terms of what they expect in terms of religion and worshiping deities, worship, worshiping their uh, national deities. So I, Isaiah comes with Shi'ar Yashub to King Ahaz and he says, um, he, he's going to try to convince King Ahaz that he should not make a treaty with the Assyrians. So that's a, that's a backdrop for some of the things that we're going to see. The, the Assyrians are a threat. Um, Isaiah wants to help Ahaz and uh, the house of David to understand that the that with the Lord's help, with the Lord's support, this isn't going to be a, the, the problem that they ultimately, that they anticipate that it will, it will be. Um, 
The name Shi'ar Yashuv means a remnant shall return. We come to the meaning, and in fact, we, we, we come to understand what the Lord is getting at in having Isaiah name this son Shi'ar Yashuv when we get to I, Isaiah 10. And this prophecy in chapter, chapters 19 through 22. And it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant, Shear, of Israel, and such as are escaped of the house of Jacob, shall no more stay upon him that smote them, but shall stay upon the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. The remnant shall return. And that, that is written out in Hebrew as Shear Yeshuv. Even to the re- even the remnant of Jacob unto the mighty God. For though thy people shall be as the sand of the sea, yet a remnant of them shall return. The consumption shall decreed shall overflow with righteousness. Now, I want you to think Book of Mormon here. Why do you think that this would be a significant name that later Book of Mormon writers could draw a message from? There's the idea of a remnant. There's sort of the idea of divine justice there. There's a remnant that suggests some idea that uh, divine, a divine punishment has taken place. But then you've got the name, the other part of the name, Yashuv, which suggests that this remnant is going to return. That's right. What do we read on the title page of the Book of Mormon? Who's it written to? Well, yes, there's, it's written to Jew and Gentile, but it, it also, the word remnant is mentioned twice in, on the title page of the Book of Mormon. We know that Moroni is the author of what, what breaks down to basically two paragraphs now, and he addresses it, it's written so that the remnant of the house of Israel may know that they are not cast off forever, that, the, that there is an opportunity for, as you noted, for there to be a gathering for the remnant to return. And th- this works on an individual level um, in terms of individuals being able to return, come unto Christ, the Holy One of Israel, and be gathered, and then th- this works with larger groups of people. Um, Joseph Smith, commenting on, on Isaiah 52, he is aware of the significance of this theme that we get in Isaiah in terms of the, the remnant returning, returning. Isaiah 52, 2. What are we to understand by Zion loosing herself from the bands of her neck? By the way, Jennifer, this gets into your text that you you talked about at at that conference um, where the you get this interesting language where the daughter of Zion is told to arise and sit down and a lot of you when you read that in the Book of Mormon or in the Bible you're like arise sit down what does that mean well you have a war captive who is war captives were often put in prone positions on the ground obvious usually not dressed with um, very lavishly, obviously. Um, the daughter of Zion is told to stand up and take her seat on a throne. Joseph's alluding to this, th- this prophecy. We are to understand that the scattered remnants are exhorted to return to the Lord from whence they have fallen, which if they do, the promise of the Lord is that he will speak to them or give them revelation. The bands of her neck are the curses of God upon her, or the remnants of Israel in their scattered condition among the Gentiles. So this prophecy in in Isaiah, which gets incorporated and quoted by Nephi in the Book of Mormon in 2 Nephi 20, becomes important because it points forward to this idea of the remnant of Israel being able to to return. Um, Isaiah chapter 11 or 2 Nephi 21, 
And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand the second time to recover the remnant of his people. The Shear right there. Which shall be left, Asher, ye Asher, from Assyria, may Ashur, and from Egypt, and from Pathros, and from Cush, and from Elam, and from Shinar, and from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. And I, when I introduce classes to this, I will... Some of you have had me in class or are familiar, when I've asked this, or familiar with this question when I've asked it. How many nations do you see represented in this prophecy here? Count them. Seven nations, and for good measure we have, and this phrase ought to be important to you here at this university, the islands of the sea. In, in Hebrew, seven is a number of fullness or completion. The point here really isn't the names of where the gathering is coming from. The point is that this is going to be a complete gathering. That's why the, the, the seven names. And just to be sure that we understand this is going to be from everywhere, we have the phrase, the Isles of the Sea, throw, thrown in here. How many nations do we have represented in this room? How many people from the United States? Or, so we got a bunch of people from the US. How many people from Canada? Anybody in here from Canada? From what, what other nations do we have represented? If you're not from the US or not from Canada, where, where, where else are you from? We got Brazil, two, Japan, Japan three, Japan. Vietnam, four, Tonga, Tonga five, mm -hmm. Philippines, six. Any other nations other than those? Where are you from? New Zealand. New Zealand. Seven. There we've got our seven, right? Good. And I suspect if I asked where you've served missions that the, the, the numbers would be similar. So you've got gatherers going out from at least seven nations in here, but also probably going out to more than seven nations. But what I try to help students from this school see is that this, uh, you're the fulfillment of prophecy here. I mean, I don't see it. It's, to me, it's more evident here where we've got such a international body of students that we have a, I don't think you could find a better fulfillment of this, this prophecy um, in history or presently than what we see happen at the school. Um, and there shall be a highway for the remnant of his people, which shall be left, Asher, ye Asher, from Assyria, may Ashur. All of this echoes that name, Shear Yeshuv. A remnant shall return. Then Isaiah is told uh, in chapter 8 that he's got to, his, his wife has a son whom he's instructed to name Maher Shalal Hashbaz. That's a mouthful. How many of you? Brethren, I guarantee you that your wife or wife-to-be does not have this name on her list of favorite baby names. <laughs> Maher Shalal Hashbaz, even though, well, let's get at what this name means. To, to speed the spoil, he hastens the prayer, as many modern translators and commentaries render it. The, the spoil speeds, the prey hastens. For before the child shall have knowledge to cry, my father and my mother, the riches of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria shall be taken away. You, I, you remember I mentioned that Syria was allying itself with Israel to destroy the kingdom of Judah. I'm going to talk more about that in just a minute. But the this shows up like the... Shi'ar Yashuv theme in Isaiah. This one shows up in a lot of places. Here's one place, Isaiah 10 again. Woe unto the, them that decree unrighteous decrees, that, that write the grievousness which they have prescribed, to turn aside the, the needy from the judgment or justice, 
and to take the right of the poor from my people, that widows may be their prey. If the King James translators had rendered this a little bit idiomatically, we would have see, seen that this is clear. You got shalal there, and that they may, make a, may rob or make a prey of the fatherless. Baz. The King James obscures the link between the verbs Isaiah uses in the name of the son, Meher Shalal Hashbaz. Israel and Judah have sped to the spoil and hastened and made orphans their prey. In other words, they've exploited the most vulnerable members of their society. And because they've done that, this name of Isaiah's second son is going to be a sign of what will happen to them. That the Assyrians will come in and, in fact, another way you might render this name is, basically the idea here is swift destruction. Maybe that is an appropriate name for a kid. <laughs> swift destruction, right? You'll, you'll figure this out when you have uh, two, three, and four-year-olds running around the house, swift destruction. But because Israel and Judah have done this to their most vulnerable members of society, the Lord is going to allow the Assyrians to come and do that to theirs. Now, back to Isaiah 7. Now, scholars are divided as to whether um, you have... As Latter-day Saints, we read Isaiah 7.14 in the prophecy about Emmanuel as a, we usually stop with Matthew, with Matthew and read this as an interpretation of what? Birth. Yeah, the Messiah's birth. But I want to suggest to you that the Emmanuel had reference to a child during Isaiah's time and place. That this was a prophecy that was fulfilled during his time now, scholars are divided. They, don't, they, don't, they can't decide whether this is, it would have been a child of Ahaz a royal, by one of his wives or whether this was a child of Isaiah's. Both of those are possibilities. Um, Isaiah 7.14 reports the birth of a son named Emmanuel. Now, you remember... Isaiah was told to come with Shear Yashub and confront and to confront Ahaz. And Isaiah tells Ahaz, he says, ask a sign, any sign. Ask it in the heights above or in the earth beneath. Ask any sign. And Ahaz says famously, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. He's being really righteous by not asking a sign, right? Wrong. He doesn't want to ask for a sign. Why? He doesn't want to know what news it brings. That, that's it. If he, he, if he asks the sign and it comes to pass, he is then going to be obligated to do what Isaiah is su suggesting that he needs to do. So... He, instead, I, Ahaz wants to go and make, an, make a treaty with the Assyrians. And just so his conscience doesn't get bothered by a sign coming through the prophet Isaiah, he's not going to ask for a sign. But Isaiah tells him, you're going to get a sign anyway. A, a virgin, therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. And that name Emmanuel means... God with us, very literally, or with us, Imanu, is God, or El. What's interesting is Matthew understands the significance of this name on an entirely different level. Where Isaiah is trying to help Ahaz understand that the Lord, or that God was with, the Davidic dynasty, and that he wasn't going to ab abandon the promises to David, and that the dynasty was going to be able to continue, Matthew understands that, this, that, the, that Jesus fulfills this Emmanuel prophecy in a whole nother way. 
that instead of it just being the Lord having his power be with the Davidic dynasty to preserve them from the Assyrians, Matthew understands that the name Emmanuel, as referring to Jesus, suggests God not just being with us, but literally being down on the earth with or among us in the flesh. And that the and Matthew understands that this gives significance to the promises made to David on a whole nother level. The Davidic dynasty doesn't last past King Zedekiah. He's that first king that's mentioned in the Book of Mormon. You remember? King Zedekiah is the last king to sit on the throne, the political throne of Judah, and no other king sits on that throne in a temporal, political sense, but the Davidic dynasty and every promise made to David continues in and is fulfilled ultimately in Jesus Christ. In fact, that is going to take us into some of these other ones. So Isaiah promised that Judah and the Davidic dynasty would not be destroyed, and he, the king of Assyria, as symbolized by the Euphrates, would pass over through Judah. He shall overflow and go over. He shall reach even to the neck, and stretch, the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breadth of thy land, O Emmanuel. Confederates Israel and Syria would not succeed in their attempt to end the Davidic dynasty. Take counsel, and it shall... Take counsel together, and it shall come to naught. Speak the word, and it shall not stand for, and here's the repetition of the name, God is with us, Emmanuel. Now the us in Emmanuel evokes the, both the divine counsel us of Isaiah 6, 8. You remember, whom shall I send, and whom shall go for us? And then it's there that Isaiah says, here am I, send me. But also, the us mentioned in the birth of another divine son who receives several symbolic names. You remember Isaiah 9-6, we're coming up on the Christmas season. Handel's Messiah famously picks up onto this. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. A better way of rendering that actually from the Hebrew is Wonderful Counselor. The Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now scholars have tried to find, some scholars have suggested that this is a reference to King Hezekiah when he's born. But... You look at these titles, and these are titles that are used elsewhere of who? Mighty God, Everlasting Father. I mean, these are... Now, Hezekiah, the, the, the ancient, the, the Deuteromistic historian, considers a, a pretty, a very good king. But... Mighty, mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace are, are fairly su suggestive. I think these titles are elsewhere, or I think these titles suggest that Isaiah envisioned a Messiah over an imperfect Davidic descendant like Ahaz or even Hezekiah. Then Isaiah says, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts. This invites us to consider the function of Isaiah's own name in his prophecies. Now the name Isaiah means, it comes from a root. See, I should have, no, I did have those here. The name Isaiah comes from a root, Yasha, which means to save. The Yahoo part of his name means Jehovah. So the idea is Jehovah is salvation or the, the salvation of Jehovah, something to that effect. Recognizing that Isaiah's name means the Lord is salvation helps us to appreciate the distinctive salvation motif that pervades his writings. And we see this over and over. 
like Isaiah 12 about drawing salvation from, uh, drawing water from the wells of salvation. You've got um, in that same song, um, thou art become my salvation. And importantly, not only is Isaiah's name derived from that root, Yasha, but that should remind you of another name. Ye Yeshua, or that's Jesus. Yeah, Greek, Jesus. That comes to, and then into English is Jesus. All right, so the Lord is salvation. Isaiah is, also has a distinctive new name theme in his writings. Um, Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, that's Hebrew azuva, or divorced. Neither shalt thy land be termed desolate, shamama, but thou shalt be called Hepzibah, that means my delight is in her. And thy land, Baula, that means married. For the Lord delighteth in thee, and thy land shall be married. Um, which two of those names do you actually see used as English names? Yeah, you see Beulah used. It's sort of archaic now. And Hepzibah is sometimes used as a name, but I don't think anybody named... I think Azuva actually turns up as a, a name elsewhere in the Old Testament, but doesn't have a very positive meaning, forsaken or divorced. Um, Shamama isn't, doesn't sound like a really a, attractive name either in terms of its meaning. Yeah, I, I don't know what the, I, it doesn't come to mind what that name would mean. All right, say ye to the daughter of Zion, behold thy salvation cometh, cometh, there's that root, Yasha, where we get the name Jesus again. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. Thou shalt not be called, or thou shalt be called, sought out, that's Darusha, a city not forsaken, lo, Ne'ezaba. Um, Jeremiah, I'm going to get back to some other symbolic names in, or symbolic child names in just a minute. Jeremiah uses some interesting um, modes in terms of using symbolic names. He uses a coding system in a couple places called Atbash. This is where you take the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, or if you're, it's a method or symbolic naming wherein the initial letter of the alphabet is substituted with that of the last letter. So you've got the name Bab Babel, Hebrew B, B, L, and it's rewritten in this code as Sh Shishak taking the second to last letter of the, so the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet, B, B, and then one of the middle letters, L, and that's substituted for Sheen and Sheen, the last two letters of the Hebrew alphabet, and another middle letter, K. So Babel is renamed Shishak, and the Chaldeans are rebranded uh, Lev Kamai. That means in the midst or the heart of them that rise up against me, something like that. These names constitute symbols of the Lord's justice overtaking the Babylonians, symbols encoded in such a way as to mask the meaning from everyone except the initiated, which represents a different type of sy symbolic naming from the other types of naming um, that are under discussion here. Uh, I mentioned Names that point to the Savior. This is one from Jeremiah, the branch, Yahweh Tzedekinu. You remember I mentioned King Zedekiah, the last king to sit on the throne of Judah. The name Zedekiah means... Zedek. This is righteousness. Righteousness. 
And that Yah, or Yahu, means Jehovah. So the name Zedekiah means Jehovah is righteous, or Jehovah is righteousness. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise up a branch, or raise up unto David a righteous branch, Sama Sadiq. And a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice, Sadakah, in the earth. This prophecy occurs again in Je Jeremiah 33. In those days, at that time, will I cause the branch of righteousness, Sema Sadakah, to grow up, Atzmiach, unto David, and he shall execute judgment in the land. And in his days, here's that root again, where we get the name Jesus. Yasha, in his days, Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called. Yahweh Sidikenu, the Lord our righteousness. In those days, Judah shall be saved, and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherein he shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. Um, this would be an important prophecy at a time in which you had the Davidic king... Fi the Davidic dynasty in, in political terms coming to an end, where you don't have a king sitting any longer, or, or shortly that would be the case, of the Davidic king no longer sitting on the, the political throne of Judah. So this, pro, this prophecy would then look forward to a, a future time of Davidic restoration. Um, and the only one who can in, I think, in a, in a meaningful sense, fill that role since Zedekiah's time is, of course, I would say, Jesus of Nazareth, whose kingdom was not of this world, as he said to Pilate, according to John's record. Um, here's one of my favorites. I'll try to <coughs> abbreviate this, because I know you guys got, to, got other places you need to be, and we got a, a late start on this. Magor Misabib, terror roundabout. You have this guy named Pashur who occupies a prominent role in the temple leadership in Jerusalem. Might be comparable to a member of a temple presidency today or something to that effect. Um, he has Jeremiah brought forth and, and beaten because of some of the prophecies that he's given. Then J Jeremiah turns around and says unto him, The Lord hath not called thy name Pashur, but Magor Masabib, terror round about. For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will make thee a terror to thy friends, and they shall fall by the sword of their enemies, and thy eyes shall behold it. And I will give all of Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall carry them captive into Babylon, and shall slay them with the sword. A few verses later, Jeremiah says, For I heard the defaming of many, fear on every side, Magor Masabib. Report, they say, and we will report it. All my familiars watched for my halting, saying, Peradventure he will be enticed, and we shall prevail against him, and we shall take our revenge on him. Here's an interesting one. Ezekiel describes the Lord as having two wives so to speak. He describes, this is a symbolic story that he uses. He uses two names, Aholah and, ah, um, and Aholibah, as symbols of the northern kingdom of Israel and Judah. The name Aholah suggests the meaning, her tent or her tabernacle. There's some temple imagery going on here. The name Aholibah or Aholibah suggests the meaning my cult tent is in her, or my tabernacle is in her. Um, the southern kingdom gets the longer name because that's where the temple is. My tent is in her, or my tabernacle is in her. Um, in Ezekiel 16, the prophet describes the Lord's covenant marriage to and the ritual, ritual purification of Jerusalem, Aholibah, in terms that resemble the, that resemble the temple rites as well as the clothing of the wilderness tabernacle. Now watch the order here, the sequence here. And if you've been to the temple, 
You ought to be sensitive to the language here. And then I wash thee with water, yea, I thoroughly wash thee, away, with, away thy blood from thee, and I anointed thee with oil, and I clothed thee also with broidered work, and shod thee with badger skins, and I girded thee about with fine linen, and covered thee with silk. You've got the sequence of washing, anointing, and clothing here. In fact, there's, there's more to this. In Ezekiel's description of the ritual clothing of Aholibah, it's hard to miss the intended connection to the tab clothing uh, or clothing of the tending of, tent of meeting or the ancient tabernacle structure. And thou shalt make a covering for the tent of, that's Ohel, of ram skins dyed red and a co covering above of badger skins. The names Ahola and Aholiba recall one of the names of the chief tabernacle builders, Aholiab, Father is my tent, from, from the Exodus. I'm going to go through um, the names of Hosea's children, and then we will call it, uh, we'll, we'll cut it short at that point. Um, and then you can ask any questions if you have any. Hosea had... Who's familiar with Hosea's story? He's asked to marry a woman named Deblai, and what do you know about her? Yeah, she's described as a, a woman of Zenunim. That's a word that can be ambiguously understood as either acts of um, prostitution or um, acts of immorality. Or they can also be understood as the word, um, as that root, zana, was often understood ancient, in ancient Israel to refer to acts of religious unfaithfulness, religious infidelity, which then makes, uh, which makes, sorry, not Deblyam, but Gomer, I apologize, got the wrong name there, which makes Gomer a fitting symbol for Israel and Judah. Um, so, Hosea's first son was, he commanded to be named Jezreel, um, a name which means, may he sow. And note the word play on Israel and Jezreel here. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. The name, Je of, Je the name, of, the name Jezreel was also the name of the Jezreel Valley, the scene of Orvis vicinity of several important events in ninth century Israelite history. The Lord thus makes Jezreel a symbol of Israel's sowing or scattering. However, he also makes it a symbol of the Lord's mercy. And they shall hear Jezreel, and I will sow her unto me in the earth. Um, then you get the second child's name. It's a daughter named Lo Ruhama, a name which means shown no mercy. Yeah, you're probably not going to name your daughter Loruhama. And again she conceived and bare a son, and God said unto him, Call her name Loruhama, for I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. This stern prophecy is somewhat softened or mollified by a promise of mercy toward the southern kingdom of Judah. But I will have mercy upon the house of Judah and I will save them. There's that root again, Yasha. It's also the root in the name Hosea. I will save them by the Lord their God and not save them by the bow. This uh, prophecy adds an elusive word play on the name Hosea when the Lord says, I will save them, the Hoshatim. And beside me there is no Savior, and you're familiar with this word, Moshiach, which sounds like the name Mosiah. Yeah. The name Mosiah probably means the Lord is Savior. Jack Welch is the, who first proposed that, I think. Now, when she weaned Loruchama, she conceived and bare a son. Then God, said God, call his name Loami. Not my people, for ye are not my people, and I will not be your God. This seems pretty bleak. It seems like a unhappy ending, but it's not. 
in the book of Hosea, you have all of these names reversed. Where it was once said unto them, ye are not my people, it shall be said, ye are the sons of the living God. In fact, this, you get more of this later on. Instead of the names Lo-Ami and lo Rukama, say ye to your brethren, Ami, my people, and to your sisters, Rukama. This you might want to name a daughter, Rukama. My people and Rukama, shown, my, shown mercy. All right. Um, there's a lot more that we could say on these. And I could, if we'd had more time and if we'd gotten started soon enough with our technical difficulties, we could have said a lot more. But um, I just want to testify to you that there, there's a theme. The names are really important in the Old Testament. And the better we understand the names and what's going on with the names, the better we understand the messages of ancient prophets. What's interesting to me is how often that root, yasha, to save is it wrapped up and revolves around some of these prophecies. Um, I testify that Jesus Christ is the, that perfect D Davidic descend descendant that a lot of these prophecies uh, anticipate and that a lot of those prophets look forward to. You remember Jacob and other Book, Book of Mormon writers say that th said that there were not any prophets that had spoken, opened their mouths to prophesy, save they had prophesied concerning the Holy One of Israel. I, I testify to you that these prophecies point us to him. And I know that, that God loves us, and he wants to save us, and he wants to gather us, and he wants to pro provide means whereby we, can, we, as the remnant of Israel, can return unto him, um, who is the... The, the God of Israel, the Holy One of Israel, and the source of all our salvation and every good thing that we enjoy in our lives. And I, I testify of that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.